This video is sponsored by longtime partners of the show, Raycon. If you're looking for something to help you unplug and unwind, then I'd like to personally recommend Raycon's Everyday E25 earbuds. I think everyone is more aware these days of how much time they spend mindlessly scrolling through their feeds, but why not break the habit by throwing on an audiobook, music, or even your favorite podcast, all while being completely hands-free in case you need to multitask. The E25s come in a variety of colors and also feature a noise isolating fit, more bass, six hours of playtime, and they won't break the bank since they're about half the price of other premium brands. Best of all, Raycon also supports often demonetized content like this, so if you'd like to both support the show and get yourself a little something, then head on over to buyraycon.com slash rainbot to get 15% off your very first order. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash rainbot for 15% off, and now on to the episode. The iconic French Quarter of New Orleans is known the world over for its food, nightlife, and perhaps most of all, its history. The architecture alone is enough to transport you to a time long since past, but in a place so rich in history, it's no wonder that some of it, or even much of it, would go either unnoticed or borderline completely forgotten. Having said this, if you google the intersection of Iberville and Charters in New Orleans, you might just recognize a couple things that surround it. Just a few minutes away is Bourbon Street, and even closer is Canal Street, where massive floats roll each year for Mardi Gras. It was here that the upstairs lounge was located, its name being quite the literal one, since the bar itself was situated on the second floor of the building that housed it. It served as a safe haven for the local gay community, and even doubled as a place of worship via the Metropolitan Community Church, which welcomed LGBTQ individuals with open arms. For many, the upstairs lounge is more than a venue, but a place where one could express themselves freely. A stark contrast to life outside, where most of its patrons had to keep their identities a secret out of fear of both personal and professional repercussions. The bar opened its doors to the public in the year 1970, but just three years later, the upstairs lounge would play host to what was, at the time, the worst mass murder of LGBTQ people in American history a grim record that wouldn't be surpassed until the Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016. June 24th, 1973. For the many regulars of the upstairs lounge, it probably seemed a day just like any other. The bar was hosting its weekly beer bust event, and on top of things, the anniversary of Stonewall was just days away. For those present at the time, however, the celebration was unfortunately cut short. At around 7.50 p.m., the familiar sound of the venue's doorbell caught the attention of an unassuming bargoer. But instead of fellow customers, upon opening the door, they were met with a massive gust of flames that quickly invaded the establishment. In an instant, the bar was set ablaze and patrons scattered in a panicked attempt to escape. Bartender Douglas Buddy Rasmussen led 20 people to safety. One witness, who chose not to identify himself to the press, described the escape, stating, quote, I went out the back door, ran through a theater where we used to produce plays, and went down a fire escape to the street. Now, the same person will later go on to clarify that neither he nor any other patrons had known about this escape prior to being led to it. And as such, many others inside rushed for windows, but only 15 were able to squeeze through the security bars and jump to the street below. A handful of others, according to reports at the time, also managed to reach a window ledge where they remained until help arrived. Dozens of others, however, were still trapped inside. The blaze lasted less than 20 minutes total, according to Fire Superintendent William J. McCrossan, who described the arson attack to the Latrobe Bulletin as the worst loss of human life he'd seen in his 32-year career. He also explained that, quote, 87 firefighters and 21 pieces of firefighting apparatus were used to combat the blaze. The firefighters were able to save those stranded on the ledge, but even though they'd responded rapidly, for those inside, it was already too late. The scene was horrific, with many of the bodies left completely unrecognizable by the damage, and several having to be identified via items that survived the heat, such as one who was identified by a ring he was wearing. Firefighters found it difficult to tell how many victims were there at times, due to the way they'd huddled together and how severely they were burned. Perhaps the most harrowing image to come out of the event was one of Reverend William B. R. Larson, whose final moments were witnessed by onlookers. A survivor by the name of Lynn Quinton explained to the press, quote, Four people burned to death in front of my eyes tonight. I was pleading and pleading with them, but they couldn't or wouldn't jump. The bigger people just couldn't get out. Bill Larson, a pastor at the Metropolitan Community Church, got caught in the window and I just watched him burn. He had one arm out and I heard him scream, oh god no, and in the next window, three people burned and I could just watch. 
Police arson squads are investigating the ruins of a New Orleans bar where a fire last night killed 29 persons and injured 15 others. This event in and of itself was obviously a tragedy, but despite the deaths of 32 people that night, not everyone was sympathetic and some were downright cruel. Reportedly, it took over three hours for fire services to remove the dead, and during this time hundreds of onlookers gathered at the police barriers to see firefighters recovering bodies. According to a Louisiana newspaper, The Town Talk, quote, one enterprising barroom owner set up an outside bar within a few feet of where the ambulances stood awaiting the bodies. The bar did booming business. Per a decades TV network documentary, the Catholic Archbishop of New Orleans, quote, offered neither sympathy nor support to the victims, with the subject of one of their interviews stating that, quote, church after church refused their sanctuaries and facilities for any kind of service. The Unitarian Church did hold a small service which was not very well attended in the days after the fire, and a few days later, St. George's Episcopal Church across town did hold a service. The priest, Father Bill Richardson, caught all sorts of holy hell from his congregation for doing that. The interviewee also recounted how radio commentators at the time would make homophobic, hateful, and often cruel jokes at the victim's expense while on air. One of the cruelest of which was, what, where, how do we bury the remains of these fire victims? And the answer, fruit jars. That was the punchline. Political and public figures apparently never felt the need to send condolences or even acknowledge what had occurred, in spite of often doing so routinely for tragedies which had impacted fewer people. Now, perhaps the most crushing lack of humanity here came from the victim's own relatives. Reverend Bill Larson, for example, whose photographed remains are forever associated with the attack, was never claimed by his family. According to Reverend Troy Perry, his mother opted not to recover and bury her son because, quote, she was embarrassed that he was publicly identified as a gay man who died at a gay bar. 32-year-old Larry Norman Frost was among three unknown white male victims up until November of 2018, 45 years after his death. He was eventually identified by his sister and nephew, though it would later come to light that Larry's parents most likely already knew of his fate, and simply chose not to come forward or to share that information with family members. Similar stories are distressingly common amongst the other victims in this case. So why did this happen and who was responsible? Shockingly, multiple people confessed to starting the fire, though there's little info about most of them. One example was a 32-year-old drifter named Raymond Wallander, who admitted to pouring gasoline in the club stairwell and setting it ablaze. He would tell police that a customer at the upstairs lounge had promised to pay his companion for a sex act, but then had gone back on the deal. In actuality, Wallander had read about the fire and concocted a story in order to get arrested and serve time outside of California, where he was already wanted. He said he feared he'd be murdered by inmates if he served time in California for whatever reason. The most likely culprit here appears to be a man by the name of Roger Dale Nunez. The Decades TV documentary posits that Nunez was one of the people involved in an argument at the lounge the night the crime occurred, and that he returned 30 minutes after being kicked out to start the fire in an act of revenge. A former friend of Nunez also later claimed that he'd admitted to being behind the fire on four separate occasions. Nunez was apparently questioned during the investigation, but upon initial questioning, he had a broken jaw and could not respond. A later conversation with him did not lead investigators to suspect Nunez, but even if he did do it, we'd never know since the man took his own life just a year after the fire. And six years after that, the state fire marshal's office would close the case due to having no leads to work with. To this day, the case remains legally unsolved, and by that fact, a motive technically could not be established, although it was very clear that this was no accident. Still, no matter the motivation of the arsonists, every refusal of service, every blind eye turned, and every unclaimed body made it clear that to many, these victims were seen as subhuman, that they somehow deserved less respect, and that they were an embarrassment. People like Reverend Bill Larson, who was a man of faith, but had his legacy reduced to a single grisly image. People like Larry Norman Frost, a free spirit who was beloved by his siblings, but left an unidentified corpse for decades who now lies in an unmarked grave on unkept land because someone felt he wasn't worth claiming. People like Ferris LeBlanc, who fought in World War II and survived both D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. He had turned 50 just a couple days before the arsonist struck, and to many, for whatever reason, that day was the point of no return where all the accomplishments and everything I just mentioned had somehow become irrelevant. Before I go, I'd like to thank every single one of you for watching, and that includes the following people. 
Gorman, Connor H, Base of Shadow, WH, Sean the CHB, AJ Runaway, Amelia J, Andrew L, Anthony, Astro, Bloody the Elf, Brandon S, the F, Catherine L, Corky Barks, Daniel G, David G, Dimitri L, Eric M, Esper Nix, Jamie P, KM, BK Ketchup, Mishi Mishi, Ronnie, Sal A, TBF, Tyler T, Ulysses, Zubicha Zalas, Daniel P, The Deck of Cards, Gyoza Fairy, Bath Time Duck, Chris M, Chris R, Clifford S, Deja, Echo Steel, Eddie, Elon Musk, Musk, I can't say that, I know that you did that on purpose. Francisco B, James M, Jamie M, Val C, Kyle R, Luck B, Matt J, Mega Brutal, Melly, Nick B, Panda Tiger, Patrick A, Pen Stift, Rye S, S Christine, Squarian S, Sky Grinder, Solar Avalon, Solar Rabbit, S, PC Zippo, Terry the Outlaw, The Man in the Crowd, Zarai, Zimbledorf the Calzone Consumer, Sir Tim Thinks a Lot, I think that's how you say that, and Steven S. Again, thank you guys so much, and if you're still listening, you're insane, but I love you, and I'll see you next time.